um, we can get the proceeding started so long. Um, it's always good to start more or less on time uh, and respect the people that um, made their way to this virtual meeting on time. So thanks very much all of you for joining uh, this webinar uh, where we're going to discuss the uh, 2022 presidential elections in Kenya and the Supreme Court judgments, the run up to it, the aftermath and everything that surrounds it with two, uh, two experts. Um, so my name is Yaab Tafisar. I work for the Dalla Omar Institute and it's my privilege to uh, facilitate this discussion this morning. It was a bit of a, a rushed impromptu affair um, put together quite hastily in the wake of the judgment that came out on Monday. Um, so I'm actually very, very pleased to see the room quite full and still still filling up more. So wonderful to have you have you here with us. Um, of course, as you know, the background is uh, the recent elections for, um, for president of the Republic of Kenya. Um, we, on the 15th of August, uh, it was announced that Deputy President William Ruto had won the uh, presidential election. Um, following a very close race, um, almost split halfway, 15.49 uh, versus 48.85 for Rai Odinga, his, uh, his competitor. He was then immediately disputed by Odinga's campaign. Uh, and also four of the seven elected uh, electoral commissioners uh, expressed some doubt uh, over the final tallying process. So uh, very tense, uh, situation ensued and just like he did in 2013 and 2017, uh, Raila Odinga petitioned the Supreme Court alleging uh, irregularities uh, with the electoral process. Um, but the Supreme Court uh, in a unanimous ruling rejected all these claims uh, and Ruto will thus be sworn in um, shortly as the fifth president of of Kenya. So that is sort of in a nutshell uh, what we want to discuss and we are joined to discuss this by two experts in this field, uh, namely Dr. Conrad Bozira and Mr. Henry Gichana. It's not a coincidence that we brought the two of them together because they're both uh, alumni of the University of the Western Cape and of the Dalla Omar Institute. Um, Dr. Bozire um, is an alumnus of the Institute, completed his PhD um, with, uh, with the Institute, uh, is the former chief of staff in the Kenya judiciary, uh, now an independent consultant and also adjunct lecturer at Strathmore University, Nairobi. And Mr. Henry Gichana uh, is also uh, associated with the Dalla Omar Institute and the University of the Western Cape, uh, in fact, still active with us and is about to uh, receive his doctorate uh, in about 24 hours. Uh, he will receive, he will walk across the stage and receive his doctorate. So I'm calling him uh, like uh, William Ruto is the president elect. Uh, Henry is the doctor elect uh, about to be um, awarded the doctoral degree. So that's going to be a very proud moment. Uh, did his PhD also with the Institute. Um, is an adjunct teaching fellow at Strathmore uh, Law School <clears throat> and was also a member of the team of lawyers uh, representing the president-elect in, in this particular case that we, that we want to discuss. So um, we get it from the horse's mouth. Um, let me also mention that both of these gentlemen were supervised by Nico Steitler, who's also in the room, uh, former director of the Dalla Omar Institute and uh, current South African research chair in multi-level government. Uh, so uh, it's great to also have uh, have you in the room, Nico, and uh, I'm sure we will benefit from your insights as well. Um, but we really look forward to being, um, yeah, to being schooled by the two gentlemen on uh, what happened and what does all of this mean for uh, politics and constitutionalism in Kenya. Um, so wonderful to have you here, gentlemen. Thanks so much for making time at short notice. Um, and yeah, the format will be fairly straightforward. We're going to listen to brief inputs from both gentlemen. I suggest about 20 minutes each. Um, and then after that, we will, um, 
we will open the floor for some conversations <clears throat> and dialogue between the two gentlemen, but certainly also with uh, everyone else in the room, whoever wants to participate. Um, so I'm certainly looking forward to hearing more. And um, I believe um, Dr. Elect Gichana is going to be first. Uh, so let me hand over to him uh, and um, uh, let's let's listen to his input. Hopefully, you should be able to uh, share your screen if you have slides. Otherwise, we will uh, we will fix that. But over to you, Henry. Right. Thanks a lot, Prof, for uh, the invitation to share. I think this should be the second time I'm talking about the elections in Kenya in South Africa. The first uh, was a seminar, I think, was organized by Prof Stateler on campus a few years back, and. Uh, I benefited from actually being part of that conversation. And I think whatever I was able to learn in the process of preparing for it, I was able to um, apply while I was uh, taking part in these uh, uh, process. So I'll try to share the slides I have. Um, Just a minute. Okay. Um, so, um, just to start with the background, which Prof has already um, provided uh, about what the context of our conversation is that there was an election in Kenya, that there were, what Prof may not have mentioned is that we actually had four candidates. Uh, the last two being uh, Professor George Wajakoya from the Root Party of Kenya and another called David Mauri uh, Wahiga of Agano Party. And the reason probably he didn't mention them because uh, when you look at the second bullet point or the third actually, you see that uh, what they got <laughs> garnered in the election was uh, very little, very few uh, votes, that's 0 .0, 0 0.4. And they got nothing in the county, 0 0.2 for the last one. And uh, uh, they got uh, they did not meet the constitutional threshold for the county. So largely the election was between uh, the two front runners, uh, William Samoy Ruto and Raila Moludinga. And Prof has actually mentioned what they got and uh, that what I've included in the brackets, I'll be able to come back to it at the end, which relate to the constitutional requirement, what they are required to get for them to be able to be declared the winner. So as Prof has mentioned, the result was obviously um, contested. And for the first time, we had a record of nine petitions, which were filed at the Supreme Court. And all of them were uh, pretty much founded on uh, similar facts. And key among them, as Prof has mentioned, was the fact that a majority of the commissioners in the electoral management body uh, disowned the results and called them those were the results of the chairperson. But uh, in the end, after the hearings uh, at the Supreme Court in a rather tight schedule, the petition was dismissed on all grounds and uh, the Supreme Court unanimously upheld the election. And as Prof has mentioned, we're looking forward to um, the swearing in of uh, the president-elect. So, um, however, I thought it important for us to be able to look at, uh, to start by looking at uh, the electoral history of Kenya so that we're able to know how far we've come as a country and the context in which these elections uh, uh, were decided even at the Supreme Court. So you look at Kenya's history, you find very interesting things. For example, uh, you know, between 1963 and uh, 2010, when the new constitution came into force, you realize that up to until 1992, ballot papers in Kenya were printed by the government printer. And as you will uh, note later on when I, I speak about the mischief that that um, created was that you were not be able to limit the number of ballot papers that were printed and where they were stored and who they were given to. Another fact was that the election was conducted by a supervisor of election, which was an office within the office of the attorney general which means that the attorney general actually had a significant influence on the elections. What transpired and whether results needs to be 
moderated as uh, the former attorney general attempted to do in these particular elections. Another important fact was that um, the, the, the system of provincial administration in Kenya, which was made up of district commissioners among others, the DCs were the returning officers. This is the central government, which is also the returning officer in the elections. And key among the functions that DCs played was they were in charge of picking, approving, and assigning election symbols to candidates. And the mischief, again, uh, we shall be highlighting in a few points down, is that if you don't have an election symbol and the DC gets to decide when you get it, he can just decide to give it to you the day before the election. And you have to run around and print posters and uh, you know mobilize your supporters and tell them, look, this is my election symbol going into the election. But your competitors who are in good standing with the government could get the election symbols way in advance, print their posters and advertise what the symbols were and in turn had an upper hand when it came to the elections. So, Another fact was voting at polling stations. Uh, so voting took place at polling stations. And then once the voting was concluded, counting was not done at the polling stations. So all these ballot boxes were carried to the district commissioner's headquarters where counting took place. And an interesting fact and the mischief that arose out of that was the fact that these ballot boxes could disappear along the way. And uh, at the end of the day, when it comes to the counting, your ballot boxes are not there, especially during the time when ballot boxes were specific to a particular candidate that unlike what happens currently where for a particular position, all ballot papers that have been voted or rather candidates for that particular position uh, have one ballot box and therefore you vote and indicate whoever it is you select and put it in one ballot box. But there was a time where one ballot box was for a particular candidate and that ballot box had a photo of the candidate. So sometimes the mischief falls, uh, a ballot box could come without the photo of the candidate. Sometimes the photos of the candidates could be stolen or they could just disappear and you wouldn't know who you're voting for. And some of the mischiefs that are pointed out is for example, the late notification of symbols and frustration by DCs, missing candidate photos in ballot boxes, and then ballot boxes could disappear en route to the district uh, commissioner's headquarters. And they could also get staff because they were being printed by the government printer. The number of ballot papers were not limited and uh, they could be uh, staffed based on who the government wanted to win any particular seat. At some point, uh, one of the former attorney generals of Kenya called Charles Junjo, described secret voting as uh, voting in secret, that you are not supposed to see the voter as he is uh, voting. And what that did is that it allowed for ballot staffing and rigging uh, during elections. So, and another thing during the single party era uh, in Kenya where there was only one party called Kanu, Kanu was also in charge of uh, holding the rallies. So you have to wait until Kanu calls for a rally. And in that rally, you're going to address um, the voters together with all your other competitors. And what that did is that once I've completed speaking, if I came fast, I just disrupt the rally and you never get a chance to be able to address your voters. So um, after, over time, a single ballot paper for all candidates was introduced. Um, a position specific ballot box was also introduced to ensure that if a box was stolen, a ballot box was stolen or lost, then all the candidates in that particular election lost. At some point in 1980, there was a Mlolongo voting system. Mlolongo is Swahili for a queue. And what happened in this particular case is where the person who is vying for a particular position stands in front of a line or his agent stands in front of a line. And then whoever that is voting for them so if the agent is the one standing in front of the line, he holds the photo of the person that he is uh, an agent for and all the voters queue behind them. So that way the argument was that it was very transparent. You will see how long the queue is and you will know who was actually won the elections. But surprisingly, the DCs being returning officers, candidates with even the shortest lines ended up being uh, elected. So over time, there were changes with the ballots being printed by foreign farms, but again, there was a mischief where those foreign farms could uh, leak samples to the national printer, the national printer would print forms, and then 
uh, I mean, ballot boxes, I mean, ballot papers, and then the whole process of ballot staffing and rigging of elections will also take place. However, uh, over time and uh, through various processes, uh, changes started uh, being incorporated into the electro, uh, electoral system, including the introduction of transparent ballot boxes in 2002, and uh, the requirement that instead of actually carrying all these ballot boxes to the DC's office, that they should be counted at the polling station. So that was way before the 2010 Constitution of Kenya was introduced, which came with a raft of changes, which I discuss in um, this slide. So under the 2010 Constitution, a key feature which was adopted uh, was a devolved system of government, which meant that the government was uh, at two levels, that is at the national level and the county level with 47 counties. Now, at the national level, elections took place for the national executive, and there was a, a bicameral, there is a bicameral parliament where um, voters get to elect members to both houses of parliament. At the county level, also, there is an executive and county assemblies, and voters get to elect directly members of the executive and the county assemblies. So, in terms of the elections, Kenya is stated to be a um, multi party democratic state in the constitution under Article 4.2. And we have a five-year electoral cycle. And the unique thing is that the very specific date for the election is provided for under the constitution, which means whatever the circumstances an election has to take place on that particular day. And in this case, the day is the second Tuesday in August of every fifth year. So in terms of how the country is divided for purposes of elections, the electoral units are made up of constituencies, counties and wards, and they uh, constitute electoral units for various positions. So what happens, unlike, unlike South Africa, where, for example, the national elections are held separately, and then local government elections are also held separately, for us, we have one general election where all uh, um, state officials are actually elected. For example, we elect six uh, individuals, or rather we elect people to six positions, both at the national level and the county level. That is the president at the national level, who is elected together with the running mate. Then we have a member of the Senate, a member of the National Assembly, and then we have a county woman representative who is uh, elected at the county level, but sits in the National Assembly. Then at the county level, we have the governor and a member of the county assembly. So all these elections are undertaken by an independent election boundaries commission or the independent election boundaries commission, which is the electoral management body established under the constitution. Now, which this is a shift from, as you can see from the history where the executive was uh, um, heavily involved in the selection of who the, the returning officers for the elections were, what the conduct of the elections um, how they were conducted from the printing of ballot papers to uh, the counting and the tallying. Now, in this case, the constitution establishes an independent body, which, in like South Africa's chapter nine institutions, is independent and is only subject to the constitution and the law and uh, is not um, under or the direction or control of any person. So, the various principles based on Kenya's history also, which were incorporated into the Constitution of Kenya 2010. And uh, some of these include the guarantee of uh, free fair election, or, or entitlement of citizens to free fair elections and the free expression of their will and the right to vote. And uh, importantly, under Article 81, the, there's a requirement that the free and fair elections are supposed to be by secret ballot, free from intimidation and proper influence. But importantly, that it should be conducted by an independent body, that it should be transparent, and five, that it should be admit, administered in an impartial, neutral, efficient, accurate, and accountable manner. Importantly also are the provisions of Article 86 of the Constitution, which requires that whatever voting method is adopted, that the system should be simple, that it should be accurate, should be verifiable, it should be secure, accountable, and transparent, among other things. So you realize now what the constitution did, it entrenched principles which the electoral system must meet, or rather standards which electoral system has to comply with. And you realize that these constitute key grounds for the challenge of election petitions when Conrad comes to speak, 
this constitute what is called the qualitative test when it comes to contesting a presidential election at the Supreme Court, whether the election was in, there was impartiality, whether there was transparency, whether there was neutrality, accuracy and accountability or whatever voting methods are used, these constitute grounds upon which now presidential elections are actually challenged at the, uh, at the, um, the Supreme Court. And as I said, it constitutes one of the two tests that are applied at the Supreme Court, which is the qualitative test, the other being the quantitative test insofar as uh, the numbers are concerned. Now, a key uh, aspect of Kenya's um, electoral system is that it adopts a hybrid system. Hybrid system in the sense that the electoral process, um, as I uh, maybe if I can just use the slides, that there's been a quest for electoral reforms since independence. And a very key turning point for electoral reforms in Kenya was the 2007 and 2008 um, elections, which were highly contested and the manner in which they are conducted, there was a lot of uh, opaqueness, there was no transparency, there was electoral malpractices, and then there was contestation by the main challenger who also happened to be Raila Odinga. And as a result of that contestation and the opaqueness, uh, even independent observers say that there were malpractices from both sides both the party that won, which was Mwai Kibaki in 2007, and the party that lost, uh, who, which was uh, uh, Raila Odinga. And the chairperson of the Independent Electoral Commission, IEC, called uh, Kivuitu, was actually on record on saying that he even himself, at the end of the voting process, the tallying process, he didn't even know who actually won. So in the end, there was violence, as the biggest crisis that Kenya has actually experienced since. And as a result of the post-election violence, lives were lost and uh, people were displaced internally up to hundreds, uh, up to I think 600,000 people were uh, displaced and about a thousand, over a thousand people killed. And it was a very key turning point for a lot of things and even for constitutionalism in Kenya. And that led also the, um, adoption of the, the subsequent adoption of the constitution of Kenya 2010. So after the, the violence, there was a coalition government and under the coalition government, there was an inquiry commission that was set up called the Krigler Commission, otherwise the full name is there. And this commission was tasked with looking into the elections that were conducted and making proposals on how to secure the integrity of the election. Uh, elections in Kenya. Now, up to this point, you'll realize that uh, what is in contest uh, in, in contention is not really the other electoral process, I mean, uh, election uh, positions. As you see, we said there are actually six elections taking place on the same day, but you realize that what has actually attracts a lot of attention, a lot of contestation is the presidential election as opposed to all these other positions. And that goes back to the history of Kenya of uh, the centralization of power and the creation of an imperial president that was an all powerful and that commanded all resources and all power. So in a sense, that concentration of power made it an aspiration that you know everyone, for you to be able to have total control, then you have to be the president. Even with the introduction of devolution and all these other positions and the devolution of power and resources, there's still a lot of interest and a lot of controversy that surrounds the election of, of the president. So um, some of the recommendations which were um, proposed by the Krigler Commission included the adoption of technology that was proposed to be used for voter registration, voter identification, and the transmission of results and then a special court for the adjudication of uh, presidential uh, election disputes. Now, as a result of those recommendations, parliament went and uh, enacted the Elections Act, which required the adoption of technology and um, which allows for biometric voter registration. That means you register using your uh, unique identifiers, your fingers, your toenails, I mean, your, 
your fingers on your hands, the toenails, your eyes, your ears, depending on uh, whether you have toenails or you don't. So those unique kind of identifiers constitute the biometric aspect of uh, the identification. Then um, the, electros, uh, the technology was also supposed to be used for uh, voter identification on polling day, on voting day, and then for electronic results transmission. So those are the specific aspects of the electoral process which were uh, required to be done electronically. But then you realize that most of the other processes are actually retained in manual form. And some of the components which are retained in the manual form includes um, identification, but only in the event where you've been unable to be identified biometrically. And uh, this one is only required to be used as a complementary system. But other manual forms of um, taking part in the process include voting, you vote manually, votes are counted manually after uh, the, uh, the end of the polling day, votes are tallied manually, collated manually. And in addition to transmission, which is done um, electronically, there's also a transmission that is also done manually. So what is done electronically is a scan of uh, the form, the results form at the polling station level, which I'll discuss later. And then now this result form, the original physical result form is also uh, transmitted by road all the way to the National Tiling Center. So the fact that there is an electronic component and there is also a manual component uh, now makes Kenya's voting system hybrid. Now, in terms of the presidential elections in Kenya, we have obviously a presidential system as opposed to a parliamentary system which is adopted in South Africa. So the president is the head of the executive and then is elected directly by the people at the constituency level. Now, for someone to be able for a candidate to win the presidential elections can be done either through the first round or through the second round and the first round one is required once voting has, has taken place to acquire at least half of the votes which were cast in that election, uh, at least more than half. More than half means 50% plus one vote. So if you get 50% of the votes plus a single vote, that is you've gone a little bit above half of the votes and that's not enough then you also have, because of the devolved system, the devolved nature of Kenya's um, governance system, you also have to have acquired at least 25% of the votes which were cast in at least half of the counties. And I think the reasoning was because of the various demographics across the ethnic communities in Kenya. And for a long time, Kenya's elections have been ethnic based. It will be possible for someone who's coming from um, an ethnic community that has very high demographics to be able to get a majority of the votes. And now to ensure that you're not just popular in two or three counties, the constitution require that you have to at least have more than 25% of votes cast in at least half of the counties, that is 24 counties, for you to be able to uh, be declared as the winner in any particular election. But in the event that um, none of the persons who are presenting themselves as candidates acquires that, then you're required, um, the constitution requires that there is a second round of elections between the two top candidates. And in that particular election, only they adopt a first past the post uh, a mode of a selection of the winner, which means the person who gets the majority of the votes is then declared as the winner in that second round of the election. So the constitution requires the Independent Election Boundaries Commission to tally and verify the results and the chairperson of the commission to declare the results within seven days of the election. So if uh, elections were taking place today, then within seven days, this time next week, the commission is required to have declared who tallied, verified the elections and declared who won the elections. Now, in the event that uh, any of the parties that lost want to contest the election, the constitution under article 140 provides for um, any person. This is a unique part of it, which includes artificial persons, non-government organizations, civil society organizations. Uh, they are able to actually petition the court and challenge the election. And once um, an election petition has been filed, 
uh, uh, once the results are declared, you're given seven days to file a petition. And once you file the petition, then the court has 14 days from the time of filing to be able to determine that particular presidential uh, election petition. And in Kenya, the Supreme Court has exclusive original jurisdiction to decide uh, presidential elections, which was also uh, a result of the Krigner Commission's recommendations. And in the event that the Supreme Court hears the petition and decides that there are grounds to invalidate the election, then the commission is required to undertake fresh elections within 60 days. Now, for the presidential election, there is a results path. The path has not been clear for a very long time. This is something that has been uh, refined over time and with these years' elections being the most clear and the most uh, secured elections. So the path of the result Voting takes place at, poll, at polling stations. And just to mention that the constituency is the electoral unit for the election of the president. So the president is elected at the constituency level, the governor at the county level, MCA at the county level, members of parliament at the constituency level, depending on uh, members of the National Assembly. So that's just a side note. But importantly, is this results path, because the security and the integrity of this result path ensures the fairness and the freeness of the election and the accountability of the system and the verifiability of the final out, the accuracy and verifiability of the final outcome. So there are three points at which um, results go through or rather uh, points where the results are actually, um, the presidential election results go through. This does not um, apply to the other six, five positions they have their own separate parts depending on um, what the position um, being vied on is. But for presidential election petitions, I mean, for presidential election um, results, voting takes place at the polling center or the polling station. So polling stations have various streams. Um, in Kenya, we have 46,229 polling stations. Now, what happens at the polling station is people come in in the morning, they vote for various uh, for the various positions, and then once they're voted, now the presidential um, ballot box is then uh, opened later on, and then now counting is done at the polling station, and then it's done in the in the, in the presence of the agents at the end of the polling day, and then once the counting has been done, then the presiding officer fills a form 34A. That is a results form. So this results form 34A is filled on the basis of the counted votes, which includes indicating whether there were rejected votes and uh, uh, how many were they. And, and once that has been done, then all the agents of all the candidates sign that form 34A. Now, once that form 34A has been uh, um, field, the Kim's kit, which I'd uh, mentioned here, the uh, the second last bullet point, sub bullet point, the Kenya Electronic Integrated Election Management System, KIMS, which, take, which is uh, the kit or the tool that is used for voter identification, voter, I mean, voter registration, identification and transmission. These are usually transmitted to each of the polling stations. So the Kim's kits are used to identify the voter when he walks into the polling station and then uh, using the biometrics. So if the biometrics, for example, are unable to identify you or you're not, you're, you're not able to be identified biometrically, there is an alphanumeric component, which means you, alphanumeric is just the number, either your ID number or your name that are used. But in the event that you're not identified biometrically and there's a requirement or a necessity for you to be identified using your alphanumeric details, then there's a form 32A that is required to be filled to indicate that this particular person came into the polling station, he could not be identified by using biometrics and therefore we had to use the alphanumeric uh, option for us to identify the voter. 
And the idea is to ensure that there's transparency and there's accountability as to show who actually voted at the end of the day and how they were identified. So at the end of the day, once that form 34A is um, filled, that's the results form, this Kim's kit is also the same one that takes a photo or a scan of the, of the form 34A. Now, a key component of the result form, which uh, I have discussed in, um, in my subsequent slide, is that it has a QR code, the result form, the form 34A, which is linked to this Kim's kit. So the Kim's kit scans that form, locks with the QR code, and then is able to transmit that result form to the National Talent Center, I mean, uh, to um, the IEBC servers at the national level. There's a public portal where that form is also scanned and uploaded to. And then also there is um, the IEBC in this particular election gave political parties and media houses and observers uh, access to this form which has been uploaded. So if the form is not for that particular polling station, the QR code will not be able to lock with a Kim's kit. So the, the Kim's kit or the, the gadget that is actually used to scan can only read a QR code which is specific to that particular polling station. So once the results have been tabulated and then the scan has been done, then the original form 34A is, uh, the book is actually provided in uh, um, duplicate. There's a carbon copies. So once it's filled, each of the agents of the presidential candidate is actually given a copy of that um, Form 34A. And then that copy, uh, other copies are actually ad attached to the polling station. There's a copy that is attached to the sealed uh, ballot box. And then now the original is actually transmitted by road to the constituency talent center. So at the constituency talent center, the returning officer at the constituency talent center looks at all or receives form 34As from all polling stations within that constituency. And then now looks at those original form 34As, uses the results contained in those original form 34As to generate a form 34B. Form 34B is a tally or a list of what a particular candidate has actually received across all the um, polling stations in that constituency. So this form 34B, then together with the original form 34As, first, the form 34B also is actually scanned using the Kim's kit, a Kim's kit which is provided uh, uh, by the IEBC, and then is also uploaded to the public portal. This public portal is uh, uh, available for access to everybody. Anyone, anywhere in any village, as long as they have access to the internet, there is a website where you just log into and if you want to see which was the Form 34A for the polling station where you voted, you can be able to download it. And it's downloaded in black, it's, uh, it's in black and white in PDF and then you're able to actually undertake your own tally, you know, tabulation of what the final outcome would look like. So once the returning officer, the constituency Italian center has scanned and sent the scanned image to IBC servers and all, all those other um, access points that are provided, then the original form 34B and the original form 34As are all taken by road to the National Tiling Center in Nairobi. And in this case, it was taken, uh, it was uh, at the Bomas of Kenya. Now at the National Tiling Center now, there's a verification process that takes place um, and tallying to generate a form 34C, which is a tabulation of what results uh, were attained by each of the candidates in all polling uh, stations across the country. And for the, the generation of form 34C, what is used is the original forms 34A, not the form 34Bs, and not the online forms which were scanned and are available at the public portal. So what happens at the National Talent Center is a verification process where you take the original form 34A, compare it with the form 34B that was filled at the constituency level. If there are any discrepancies, they are written down in an error form. 
And once a verification process has actually taken place, and then the Form 34C begins being generated by the IEBC. Now, what, what was unique in this particular election is that the verification stage at the flow of Womers of Kenya, the agents of all the parties are there all the, uh, the presidential candidates and they have given desks. So a, a constituency tallying center returning officer comes with all the form 34 A's and all the form, form 34 uh, B's, gives them to the commission. The commission makes copies from the original and hands them to each of the agents. Now each of the agents use both the original and that copy and the ones they that was given to the their agents at the polling stations, which is assumed was sent to them to be able to compare that the original form 34A and form 34Bs tallies with what was uploaded in the portal and what was given to the agents on the ground or rather at the polling station level. So that if there are any errors, then they're pointed out to the IEBC. And at the end of the day, that result, which is actually entered in the form 34C is the results which has been um, verified by all the political party agents. Now, what happened in this particular uh, election is that agents from one party decided that uh, just comparing the numbers and the signatures is not enough. We want to undertake a forensic audit of these original form 34 A's and B's to that which is uh, available online. And that included looking at the security features which were contained in the result forms from 34A and from 34B. There were eight security features for each of the result forms. So there was a watermark, there's uh, um, other features which you could only see by using UV rays. So they actually undertook a forensic analysis of the original originality of form 34As and originality of form 34Bs and confirmed or verified that indeed they are the same copies with the form 34As that are available in the public portals before those elections were taken and then used to generate form 34C and any errors were recorded in an error form. Now, um, as part of the, a key part of this whole uh, result path is that the, and from my explanation is that the form 34A that was generated at the polling station level is the final reflection of what the president got at that point. So the poll voting or the uh, at um, or rather the results at the polling stations are final. This is uh, uh, can, can be read under Article 138.3c of the Constitution and has also been emphasized in that case which I've highlighted there that whatever result a candidate gets at the polling station is final, is not subject to any alteration or changes, even when verif verification is being taken, uh, is taking place at the National Tallying Center, you can't change the result that is reflected under Form 34A. All you can do is indicate what the error is in the error form. So there's also those provisions that uh, the IBC is required to tally and verify the results. And then 138.10 that the chairperson then after tallying and verification has been completed, then the, uh, the chairperson is given the mandate to declare the results. And those two provisions constituted one of the key contestations in the elections. What the IBC constitutes under 138.3c and whether that refers to the chairperson vis-a-vis uh, -vis the commissioners. Now, some of the things that I've already explained are already contained here, measures which were taken to ensure the integrity of, uh, of the election. And as I mentioned in my explanation, there was a highly improved and secure technology. And a key part of that was that it used block, uh, blockchain technology, which was key in ensuring that there was no infiltration of the, result, uh, the results uh, transmission system. The Kim's kids are polling stations. Um, the Kim's kids, they had polling station specific unique identifiers and procedures that this Kim's kit cannot be used for any other polling station. So, the ballot paper and the, the, uh, the, the results transmission form on the Kim's kits were specific to that particular polling station and the QR code confirmed that and it could only transmit results from that particular polling station and not, not any other polling station. And a particular Kim's kit can be traced back to where um, the polling station for which results it transmitted. So the scanning of the results were done in black and white and transmission was done uh, as PDF, which means that normally when you scan something, you can scan it in color and you only get it in J JPEG, that is as an image. 
But what was unique about these is that the scan was done in black and white and the, the King's Kit had an app that transmitted it as a PDF rather than an image. And then now transmission of the results from the King's Kit from the polling station was done to the IBC servers and to the public portal, which was accessible to everyone and which ensures that there was transparency. But then now what was unique also was that media stations and political parties and observers were given an API access to the results which were transmitted um, electronically. So there was also an improvement of the ballot papers and the results form compared to the previous elections. So the um, ballot papers were serialized and they were polling station specific. Ballot papers numbers were fixed. If a particular polling station had uh, 700 voters, which was the maximum for any polling station, the ballot papers that went to that polling station were exactly 700. Those were required to be accounted for. If only 400 voters showed up, only 400 ballot papers are supposed to have been used and the serial numbers for those particular ballot papers um, are provided. And this ensured that there were no ballot staffing, there was no interchangeability of ballot papers across polling stations, among other things. Also, what I mentioned, the QR codes for the result transmission um, forms, which was linked to the Kim's kit and the eight security features for result transmission forms. And then uh, agents of um, various uh, candidates were given uh, a copy of uh, the results form at the, the, both the polling station and uh, the constituency talent center. So the hybrid nature also came in very handy uh, in the sense that the scan form 34As, which were uploaded the portal and sent to servers, served as a copy of the results which could be compared with the original which is then brought physically to the BOMAS of Kenya, which is the National Talent Center. And importantly, there were legal safeguards, um, developments in the law that ensured that there was, a, um, uh, the elections were actually, the integrity of the elections were, was preserved. That is uh, the declaration of finality of uh, polling station results. That was very important. The results cannot be changed along the way from the polling station to the National Tiling Center to the, constituent, uh, the constituency tiling center. So whatever was declared at the polling station is final and is what is used to compile the Form 34C at the national level. And then lastly was the requirement uh, for verification. Uh, the requirement for verification and generation of error forms rather than variation. So even if there's an error at the National Talent Center that is identified either in a Form 34A or in a Form 34B, whether it's an arithmetic error or whatever form of clerical error is recorded in an error form rather than um, the IBC chairperson or the commission has been given a free hand to just vary the result. That ensures that the finality of polling station result was emphasized and that there was no tempering with, um, there was no tempering with the, the elections. So at the end of the day, as much as these sub, they're definitely, sorry. Uh, we're just running out a bit out of time. So if you can uh, start wrapping up, then we can go Look, over to Thank you. Thank, thanks, Prof, and uh, uh, sorry for that. Uh, this should be my second last slide, uh, just highlighting the issues that arose that despite all those security features and those, those processes and uh, measures which were um, put in place to ensure the integrity of the election, a number of issues arose there was uh, definitely contestation and there was a petition which was filed at the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, those were nine petitions, as I mentioned at the start. And um, these are the issues which the court distilled after looking at all those petitions and consolidating them into one petition. So I think most of these will be discussed uh, with uh, uh, Congress, under Congress presentations. But as you can see from one related to technology and whether it was in uh, the, its integrity, verifiability, security and transparency was guaranteed. Number two was um, an allegation that there was interference with the uploading and transmission of from 34As from the polling station to the I IBC server. The core allegation was that uh, the transmission did, was not um, direct, that at some point the respondents, we, who is the president elect's team, captured those forms, changed them, about 11,000 forms, and then uploaded them in the portal. And then now, um, the number three, that there was a difference between the uploaded forms in the portal and those which were received at the National Tiling Center. And then number four was about um, some elections which were postponed. 
not at the national level, not the presidential elections, but uh, governor um, elections for the position of governor and constituency level elections were postponed. And there was an allegation that that was a voter suppression tactic. In the number five, um, there was an allegation that given that we are voting for six people and you're given six ballot papers to vote for, how come then that the votes for the president are different from the votes for the senator, are different from the votes. The total votes for the president vary across those particular um, positions which were being voted for on the same day and uh, you're given the same ballot paper. So those other issues may be uh, aired a bit by Conrad, but at the end of the day, uh, the court was of the view that in none of those grounds was evidence provided that convinced the court that the allegations provided by one of the parties was actually um, true. So the court found in each of those particular nine grounds for the respondent, that is the president-elect, and uh, was a bit harsh on uh, the um, petitioners because some of the evidence which was presented in court was said to be um, possible forgeries, among other things. But importantly, there was a unanimous decision of the court that um, the elections were free, fair, and, and transparent. So the last part, uh, which is my last slide, um, Prof, sorry, um, I may have taken a little bit more of time, uh, is really what this means for constitutionalism and politics in Kenya. Um, as you have seen from the history all the way up to the just concluded elections, there's been a gradual and steady progress towards free and fair elections which are transparent and are administered by an impartial neutral, in an impartial neutral manner, as you can see. So even perceptions among Kenyans from 2013 to 2017 to 2022, 2013, there were uh, allegations of rigging, which didn't even survive the presidential, which survived even the presidential election uh, petition, the dismissal of the petition. 2017, there were still allegations of, uh, of uh, rigging and even the public perception of the process uh, was not transparent. And currently what happened in, in, uh, now is that the court started by looking at the question of trust. Even when you look at the judgment, the focus was on the trust that has been um, lacking on the part of the IEBC and how transparently these elections were conducted. And in a sense, there is an improvement now of trust for the um, on the part of the election management body. A very important part for constitutionalism, which is um, uh, my last point, is that in these elections, there were very grave allegations which were made against the state, against uh, national um, uh, I mean, uh, security agencies, against senior members of the, the government, against the commission, as the majority of the commission, that there was an attempt to actually um, tamper with the will of the people moderate it in favor of the petitioners, moderate it to ensure that at the very least, if you cannot declare the other party the winner, at least force a rerun, so that at least the other party actually has a chance of, um, of being a president. These came internally from the commissioners, four commissioners out of the seven in the commission, tried to uh, force or rather request the, uh, the chairperson and the other commissioners to moderate the results. The chairperson also records in his soon affidavit before the court that he was also visited by senior members uh, of um, uh, um, senior members of the other party in the middle of the night around 3 a.m. and asked to actually moderate. And a, a member of that delegation was a former attorney general who was telling the chairperson of the IBC that when I was the attorney general, I used to moderate these things in favor of the law and stability. So there's a chance there will be instability if you don't declare Raila Odinga as the winner. And uh, if you end up decla declaring a William Ruto as the winner, therefore, at the very least, moderate the results. And uh, one of the delegation was saying you'll be highly rewarded if that is uh, the case. And a very critical one was uh, an allegation in the affidavit of the chairperson that um, the National Security Advisory Council, members of the National Security Advisory Council, very senior officials of government actually visited the chairperson and tried to have a conversation with the chairperson with the same objective. One, moderate the results in favor of Raila Odinga, and two, at the very least, force a rerun or a runoff. And in both cases, the chairperson says that he resisted all those attempts 
insisted on having meetings with all the other commissioners and not just himself. And in the end, he guarantees that whatever result um, outcome uh, was declared was an impartial or neutral outcome that was not influenced by any of those overtures. So for constitutionalism, this is a, a brilliant point. If at all these uh, um, allegations are actually true and they are very heavy, given that they are actually uh, provided under oath, and uh, I understand that actually there's evidence of all these allegations. And looking at it from the perspective of the independence of the institution of the commission and going forward, there's definitely an increased level of trust. There's an increased uh, level of independence and assertion of independence by the commission, which portends good things for constitutionalism in Kenya. So I'll stop there and I've taken a lot of time and uh, allow Conrad to come on and uh, be able to present on the second part of uh, today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Elect Gichana, uh, for that wonderful and uh, comprehensive uh, insight into the electoral system in uh, in Kenya. And I think one of the key things that stands out is how important the um, you know sort of the, the precise nature of electoral management and how all these things tie in together and 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 consolidate into a system that must ensure integrity of, of an electoral outcome and the complexity of, of, of the hybrid uh, approach to, to, to tallying the results. Uh, I think there was an excellent overview. Uh, and with then some, some good news in the end about the impact of, uh, of this on, on constitutionalism in Kenya. So uh, let's go straight over to uh, Dr. Conrad Bozire for uh, further input on this topic. And maybe can, we can make, make use of the platform um, of, of the chat box if you want to engage with, uh, with, with, with Henry's uh, presentation by perhaps asking some questions of clarity in the chat box, uh, maybe we can sort of multitask a bit and um, deal with some of those questions while we're listening to, to Dr. Bozire. Uh, so feel free to, to use the chat box and, um, and our panelists will, uh, will respond uh, wherever they can, otherwise we can pick it up later. Um, but in any event, let's move over to, to Dr. Bozira. Conrad, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Yap, uh, for this opportunity to present uh, uh, here. And uh, thank you uh, for all availing uh, yourselves for this. Um, and also thanks to the first uh, speaker who has really laid a very broad uh, background on, on, on the topic uh, here uh, today. So maybe uh, <clears throat> before I speak, we'd agree that um, um, uh, that uh, uh, Henry going fast, he gives that very broad uh, background on the electoral process in Kenya. I hope you can all see my slides. Yes, we can see it. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So and uh, then uh, also uh, give some background and uh, history of the process of electoral management. And I was to look at the aspect of uh, adjudication of presidential election disputes and their impact on um, uh, on constitutionalism uh, in Kenya. So what I've done here is to uh, provide uh, the, 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 the topic that I've uh, chosen for today here is the uh, presidential election petitions and constitutionalism in Kenya and from the lens of the 2022 uh, general uh, elections. Now, uh, in order to do this, uh, I have uh, five parts of my presentation. I realized time has gone, so I won't go into a lot of details and explanation, just an outline of what I wanted to do. Some historical context pre-2010 and post-2010. Uh, 2010 is significant because uh, this is the time when we adopted the current constitution under which the last three general elections have been held since 2013. And then looking at the presidential elections under the 2010 constitution, and then looking at the presidential election petitions, very briefly, the major issues and the major differences between those three elections. And then uh, with, uh, as per the theme of the, the discussion today, uh, look at the impacts uh, of uh, these three uh, events, uh, election petitions, on uh, constitutionalism in Kenya, and of course, looking at the negative and the positive uh, that has emerged uh, from these three major uh, issues. 
So I'll move on to the next. Uh, um, I'll move on to the next uh, uh, slide. Uh, so here, some bit of history. We crossed over to independence in 1963 with two major political formations, uh, two parties, Kanu and uh, Kadu. And the Kanu won independence elections and the uh, Kadu folded in 1964. All members crossed over and we had one party. So we had a de facto one party state between 1963 and 1982. This basically means that uh, you could have another party, but uh, politically, we just had one party uh, operating. In 1982, there was an attempt by some political dissidents to register party, and that is when President Moi panicked and went to parliament and uh, they introduced Section 2A to the Constitution, which provided that Kanu shall be the only party um, uh, in the country. And 1982, uh, this is deep in the Cold War period. Um, this was not uh, strange in Africa. Actually, it was worse in other places where there were no political parties. And we stayed now with a de jure one party state with this constitution providing that Kanu shall be the only political party until 1991. Uh, this should be, this period or era should sound familiar because this is a time uh, the Berlin Wall collapsed and uh, there were demands for constitutional and political reforms in Africa, in America, Asia, uh, challenging the Cold War regimes. The Cold War period and the regimes that sprang up all over the Third World. So uh, President Moi, under pressure, uh, agreed to the amendment of uh, Section 2A. And the following year in December, we had the first multi-party elections uh, since the independence elections. And here can won with 36% uh, of the vote uh, because we had uh, an ethnically split uh, opposition and uh, Moi easily won uh, with that, with, with that uh, uh, context. Uh, moving on to uh, 1997, the second multi-party elections, Kanu still won. Uh, the parties were fragmented. They could not mount a challenge on the incumbent. And in 2002, we had a major change. There was an overwhelming victory for the united opposition against the Kanu candidate. The then Kanu candidate is the outgoing president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, who could not defeat a, an opposition that was now united. Then in 2007, the winning coalition split and uh, we had uh, Raila, uh, who was declared uh, first run-up, and Kibaki declared winner under very, very controversial circumstances, uh, that, uh, and, and the swearing in that happened after hours, uh, which just led to a bloodbath in the country. Raila uh, contested at this time and said that uh, he'd won the election, and, but said he's not going to court. Uh, this is important for our discussion later uh, with the with the presidential election petitions. He said that uh, there is no guarantee of a fair outcome from the courts, and there was no need uh, for him to go to court in 2007. And actually, this contributed uh, to the chaos and uh, violence that we witnessed at that time. Um, in 2010, uh, August, uh, Kenyans overwhelmingly uh, voted for the current constitution almost 70% of the voters returned a yes vote to endorse the current uh, constitution. So briefly, that is the journey we have traveled with elections. Um, so what does the constitution provide? It says we'll hold elections very specific on Tuesday of August after every five years. So without fail, it's not Wednesday, not Monday, but Tuesday. Uh, elections uh, are organized along other elective seats, uh, the six which Henry talked about. Uh, the presidential candidate has to garner at least 50% plus one vote of the votes cast in the 24 of the 47 counties. So there's a threshold, there's a vote margin that is required. In the absence of that, we go into a runoff between the two top candidates in order to determine the winner and Whoever has the most votes in the, in, the, in the rerun then becomes president. There is a five-year term limit for the presidency. 
Uhuru just finished uh, his second and final term. And then we have a system of uh, first past the post for all elections. Actually, except for the vote margin for the president, all other elections, the one who gets the most votes, regardless of the margin, becomes the elected representative in the other five uh, positions. Um, then, uh, before 2010, and looking at specifically the presidential election petitions, the presidential election petition was treated as any other and was handled in the first instance at the High Court. Before then, we had the Court of Appeal at, as the Apex Court, and so there was one step of appeal to the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Constitution, by then, as uh, Henry explained, had an imperial presidency. The judges, appointment of the Chief Justice, and every other thing about the judiciary was controlled by the president. And this was in the Constitution. This was as a result of merging head of state and head of government functions in one person, the president, and they had such sweeping powers that you could not guarantee. So Raila, to some extent, was right that he was not guaranteed of a fair outcome from the courts as they were then constituted. So to give an example, in 1992, Mwai Kibaki, our, uh, the late uh, previous uh, president, former president, um, went to court to challenge the election victory of Moi in 1992. And the, the courts threw out that petition because he did not uh, personally serve the president. And I can assure you, Moi was very uh, inaccessible. You had to go through 100 barriers to get to him. And the, the court said that you need to serve him personally without recognizing the circumstances of doing such a service. Uh, in, uh, in 19... That was in 1997 for Mwai Kibaki. In 1992, we had a candidate called Kenneth Matiba, who came second. And uh, the petition was thrown out because uh, the petition papers were signed by the wife. By then, the, this guy had gotten a stroke and he was in a hospital in London and he gave the powers of attorney to the wife to sign the documents. But still, the court insensitively uh, insisted that. Uh, Kenneth Matiba had to sign the documents in the absence of which there was no petition validly filed in court. So those two were, were, were thrown away on those grounds and actually they validate the claim that Raila made in 2007 that under the old constitution uh, there was no justice to expect from the courts because of the kind of hold the executive had on uh, the, 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 the election process. So uh, all these factors led to a call for constitutional reforms to guarantee independence of courts and to enhance public trust uh, in, the, in the court system. The 2007 post-election violence resulted in specific attention to the independence of courts vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the presidential election, the ability of the courts to handle. And some of these uh, concerns led to uh, the, 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 the post-2010 dispensation with regard to a presidential election petition. So here, the Supreme Court has the original and final jurisdiction to determine presidential election petitions. This is different from when it was just an ordinary election petition, which started from the High Court going up. But now the Supreme Court is the court with the original um, uh, powers and final powers to determine a presidential election petition. As Henry mentioned, any person can file a petition challenging the election. Uh, previously, it was just candidates, um, but now anyone, any Kenyan, it's a public interest issue and they could do uh, that. Uh, the, for instance, uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, this just concluded petition, there were nine petitions, uh, one by the candidate, uh, uh, to, uh, to, by, by the candidate uh, who, who lost, uh, Raila Odinga, eight others by various uh, people, uh, Kenyans, uh, organizations uh, participating. The, the, the standing has really been opened up. President-elect uh, cannot be sworn in until the petition is determined. And these are very specific provisions which cure all sorts of mischief that happened during the transition process. They even provide the times within which uh, the swearing in should happen. It can't happen after sunset as witnessed uh, in 2007. 
there are very strict constitutional timelines for transition management uh, during the election. For instance, the constitution prescribes that the morning of Tuesday after the conclusion of the petition, the president-elect has to be sworn in. So on Tuesday next week, we see uh, pre president-elect Ruto uh, assuming office. The court has to determine the petition within 14 days. That is cast in stone. It has presented a big challenge, but they have found a way of uh, managing and balancing this. And there is no election from 2013 where an election petition has not been filed. So 2013, 2017, and 2022, we had uh, presidential uh, election petitions. So let's just look very, very briefly. I didn't go into detail because of time, but the factors that and the major issues that defined uh, the, 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 the last three petitions. In 2013, like 2022, the courts were unanimous. They, uh, they upheld the elections. So two of the three were upheld. Something significant and for later comments maybe is that, uh, and I see this as the difference between 2013 and the subsequent two position, uh, petitions, is that the court rejected substantial additional evidence because of timelines. They said they will not be able to look at and consider the additional evidence and the uh, additions without um, uh, impacting on the time constraints and all that. So a big part was left out. But in 2017 and in 2022, the court actually prevailed over the parties to allow affidavits filed out of time in order to have ventilation of evidence from both parties and to reach a fair conclusion. So that is the past difference. In 2013, the court actually ordered scrutiny of some ballots from some polling stations because of the total difference that was contested in court and how those results would impact the, the final uh, result. But surprisingly, the court in its uh, judgment did not consider this uh, evidence. If you look at the and read the 2013 uh, judgment, it, it, it actually did not address the issues it sought out to address in the, in the, in the, in the, in the petition. Uh, it come 2017, unlike the other two uh, petitions here, it was a majority decision, four against two. Uh, actually, the court has seven members. But this time the court took the risk of having an even number and uh, we don't know what could have happened in, in, the, in the event of a 3-3 a, a three, three, um, uh, majority, uh, sorry, uh, decision. It could have fallen out and maybe caused a, a mini constitutional crisis, but, uh, but the, the majority uh, it came to 4-2 and therefore majority carried the day. They admitted additional uh, affidavit evidence filed late, as I mentioned, they went further to appoint court ICT experts to assist in the scrutiny of the servers and transmitted votes electronically and to file a report back to court, which the court relied on. This was important because the law actually provides, it's not out of administrative efficiency, it's a requirement of the law that for transparency and in order to address the issues which Henry dealt with the, that characterized our history, we require technology in order to enhance transparency. And therefore, uh, ICT formed a big part uh, of the decision to cancel the election. And ICT experts were yes, uh, They ordered uh, scrutiny of votes in uh, 41 or 48, 48 polling stations. And a report was filed in court. Uh, no, uh, that, that was also in 2022, sorry. I was referring to 2022 with the 48 polling session, but, but even in 2017, there was uh, verification. Judges viciously attacked by President Uhuru for canceling the election and President Uhuru's allies during 2017, it was a very, it was a moment of acrimony in the country after the cancellation, which was the first. Um, in 2022, in a 30 page summary read out by the CJ, Supreme Court unanimously dismissed the nine petitions and upheld the election of the president-elect, William Ruto. The Supreme Court is yet to issue a full judgment. Uh, scrutiny of the select ballot boxes was done, the 48 polling stations I just mentioned. Scrutiny of servers used in the results transmission and, and the report filed in court and all were used in the analysis presented uh, in, this, in, in the, in the, in the 
a summary of the longer judgment that is to come. So basically, uh, that is a summary of the three uh, election petitions which have happened under the current constitution. And what is the impact of uh, the presidential election petitions on constitutionalism? I was looking at recent events and I thought some interesting quotes uh, from the outgoing president would put this discussion in context. Um, when uh, the court ruled that uh, William Ruto is the bona fide winner, uh, the, 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 the State House uh, issued uh, a clip on YouTube, it was not a live transmission, of the president. And here, uh, he sort of questioned the coherence and consistency of the Supreme Court. Uh, keep in mind that uh, President Uru Kenyatta viciously campaigned against his deputy in favor of Raila Odinga, very interesting Kenyan politics. And uh, so he was questioning, is it about numbers or process? Can our institutions rule one way in one election and another way in another election? So this was a, a thinly veiled criticism of the Supreme Court. He didn't mention it, he was just saying constitutional institutions. And generally saying the Supreme Court is inconsistent and incoherent in its decisions regarding presidential election petitions. If I can explain this further, um, in uh, 2017, the court said, um, you look at the substantive effect, uh, the numbers. Uh, did, did the candidate actually garner the numbers and the thresholds put in the constitution? The other limb is whether uh, there were substantial irregularities as to warrant the cancellation of the, the election, regardless of the numbers. So when you look at the process, then you're looking at the substantial irreg irregularities which warrant the cancellation. And actually, the 2017 election petition, the court was very strong on the process. It says, even if the numbers speak a story, if the process had substantial irregularities, that alone is a ground to cancel. Come to 2022, uh, the court in its summary judgment, uh, summary of the judgment said, um, the, the numbers and the manner in which they were transmitted and the, and the doubts cast on the numbers do not hold any water and the president the, the president elect was um, was um, uh, validly elected so we'll wait to see the actual judgments in a few weeks in a few weeks but basically what was they were say they, they spoke more to numbers as well and they dismissed the allegations about the process they said uh, the irregularities um, uh, were not there of course the context as i said earlier is that the president Uru supported the first run up Rail Odinga against his deputy with whom they had a fallout uh, in the second term. Uh, but the other profound statement uh, he made in the, in, the, in, the, in the coalition meeting yesterday was that uh, I will hand over power smiling because it is constitutional, but I will leave knowing Baba, that's what we call Raila here, uh, is my leader. So for me, uh, and especially when you, you look at the political traction that the constitution is gaining. These are uh, profound uh, steps. It just shows you that uh, we are getting uh, somewhere. Now, uh, in, the, in the court, some of the issues, and I think this slide should have come early above, but nevertheless still important. The main issues which have characterized the petitions are the 50% plus one vote uh, threshold. Was it met? So, you know, in Kenya, the the candidate who wins usually wins by um, a very, very, very narrow margin. In, uh, 2017, in 2013, uh, President Uhuru won with around 50,000 votes uh, margin. Uh, in the 2022, uh, William Ruto won with um, slightly over 200,000 votes. We are talking about a total of 14 million um, uh, votes. Uh, and uh, 22 million registered voters. And so it just shows you that people who vote, we are uh, divided in equal halves of the of the votes cast. And it, it, it's quite a competitive uh, process. So one of the issues here that uh, lawyers really contest is to try and bring, to try to bring evidence in court to show that the winning candidate 
had 49.9%. That is enough for them to cancel the election. So there's usually a lot of evidence on the quantity of votes. And they challenge a number of votes that could bring the victory under below uh, under 50% because of the margin that is required. The, the other issue is reliability of the technology in vote transmission. There, always, uh, there have always been uh, allegations of interference with vote transmission. The substantive effect rule, uh, this is whether uh, it affected the, the outcome or there were substantial irregularities, process versus numbers, which I've just talked about. And then there was also the issue of final results because of the chairperson perceived as the national uh, returning office of the presidential election. But this was settled in a case by the Court of Appeal where they said that the polling station is where the final vote declaration happens. These other processes are just telling and announcement, but the polling station results are the primary evidence of the votes cast. There's also the issue of vote differentials between the six different positions. You find, especially in 2017 and 2013, this was really highlighted that you find in a, a particular constituency, uh, the presidential vote is more by several thousand of votes than the others. Uh, the, the implication being that uh, a, a voter voted only for the president and not the others, but then the electoral management body in those uh, elections, especially 2017, could not demonstrate uh, where the extra presidential election ballot votes came from. Then the role of the chairperson, which uh, uh, Henry uh, spoke about. Um, and uh, so that brings us that context. So some impacts, I've, I've, of course, I've alluded to some of them. The cancellation of the presidential election petition set the basis and tone for change uh, to the management of the presidential elections. Before 2017, uh, we couldn't imagine uh, a sitting president or a, or a presidential election being canceled. Now it's a possibility. Actually, every candidate uh, litigates with a possibility that their election will be upheld or with a real possibility that their election will be canceled. And I think this is a big gain for the constitution because uh, if like in the pre-2010 era, you go to court, you, you just know at the back of your mind that the court find a place to uphold. And of course, in the background of the pre-2010 jurisprudence, where the African courts have repeatedly held that it's impossible to, to, to uh, overturn a presidential election result, unless uh, under very, uh, and, and this has already been stated in judgments across Africa, but this, uh, we have broken that barrier and it's actually possible to cancel an election petition. And that is a win because then the court is placed at a position to make a fair judgment and result without uh, disruption. And, and we thank the 2017 court for this. The electoral management body has improved in terms of management of the process. And this is thanks to the petitions actually, because like in the 2017 petition, it enumerated the number of faults that the electoral management body, the IEBC committed. And in my own assessment and judgment, uh, the IEBC actually took this judgment and implemented all this. You had Henry talk about the portal for the results. They were accessible to anyone and everyone. And everyone tallied, of course, with different results at the end, but uh, with the majority of independent tallies showing that William Ruto won the election and the, 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 the court went uh, with that without ordering a total recount of votes, which would, not, which would not have been possible within the 14 days allowed. Consolidation of jurisprudence and issues that underpin the adjudication of the presidential election dispute. And uh, despite what the outgoing president says, there's actually consistency in the court's jurisprudence. And I think uh, it's just maybe partial uh, or, or, or uh, a biased way of looking at the outcomes, but if you look at the jurisprudence, it's well balanced and within the confines of what the constitution uh, provides with regard to adjudication of presidential election disputes. The uncertainty of a court or ballot victory, even to the incumbent or the incumbent's preferred candidate, is a score for constitutional democracy because the Kenyan constitution says that power emanates from the people. So if the incumbent, actually, uh, as I say in the, my next point, uh, the myth of deep state or system in Kenya has been actually demolished. 
uh, by both the election management process and the court outcome here. And that lays uh, a proper foundation. In two of the three, we have had unanimous court decisions. Uh, and in the first instance, they speak to an independent court that is firmly committed to objective work. Although you again look at, uh, for instance, the 2013 decision, which raised a lot of questions and the credibility of the assessment of the evidence which was before it. So therefore, unanimous decisions, um, they can actually, they are at the first impression, a presentation of um, a credible and independent court, but that needs to be looked at within the lines. Um, then what are some of the negative uh, things that uh, still remain with us? And they are not the fault of the courts. They are just uh, faults of the Kenyan political system. Um, presidential elections still hotly contested and the likelihood of violence is always alive at every election. So that is a possibility, that is a reality that uh, we have to live with unless and until we fundamentally reform our politics and institutions are showing us the right way to do it, but we still remain a very politically divided uh, society. And that is enhanced by the margins. I said in 2013, 50,000, 2022 over 200,000, and then around 14 million votes. So it shows you we divide half half with the leading uh, coalitions. Uh, the split in the commission three versus four over the announcement of presidential raised the risks of events turning ugly. Actually, when we saw a parallel press conference by commissioners and the chair announcing the other side, already people witnessed the 2007 situation were saying, wow, this looks familiar uh, and we hope we don't end that way. But somehow uh, the situation was brought under control. There is increasing voter apathy. There is, the elections are still very competitive between the, the, the candidates, but the voter turnout seems to be going down. There is fewer and fewer voters participating in the elections. The, the, the reasons for this are still not clear. We have 22 million registered voters, so just about uh, half or slightly more than half of the registered participate uh, in these uh, elections. Last voter registration, we were told the ABC wants to register 4.5 million voters. They only managed, managed 760,000 in the last uh, voter registration drive. So that also is an indicator that there is an apathy or among uh, the voters, but and, and it's actually um, eating on the credibility of the entire democratic process where uh, critical participation of the masses uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, required. But uh, overall, I think we have made substantial progress in terms of um, uh, the, the management of elections, in terms of adjudication of elections. With every test of our institutions, they have emerged uh, stronger. And it appears to me that uh, the politicians are actually increasingly playing within the four corners uh, of the constitution. Nothing is perfect, but there seems to be some progress. Again, nothing is assured going forward. Uh, as an example, I'm sure you've heard of the Constituency Development Fund. This is a, a fund that MPs control for local development, and courts have over and over pronounced it as unconstitutional. Yesterday, uh, the president-elect assured MPs that uh, the, the, the fund is going nowhere. Uh, and uh, they are basically clutching on straws that there is a new act that was passed by uh, parliament, and that is not the one which has been nullified. But uh, if they get objective advice from their lawyers, there is no space for a CDF type of constitution in the current constitutional dispensation. And uh, they just need to prepare to let it go and maybe seek relevance of MPs to their constituents within what the constitution provides. And that shows you that uh, despite all this progress, we never know what other assaults on the constitution will be thrown from the political class and it's just to remain uh, vigilant. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Conrad. Thank you, Dr. Kuzira, for an excellent uh, overview of um, yeah perspectives on um, the the petitions that we have seen in Kenya against um, the outcome of, of election. I think a very very interesting interesting overview. 
Um, so thanks. I we have uh, reached the end of the scheduled time for this webinar, but with the permission of of my panelists, uh, we can maybe go over time a little bit. Um, but for those of you who, uh, who 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 want to leave us because you have other matters to attend to, we don't will not hold it against you. So feel free to um, to exit the meeting if you uh, if you're running out of time. But um, hopefully we can still pick up on some of the conversations in in the chat and and in the room. Um, so some of the questions were already addressed in the chat, but just to quickly go over them, Khalib Khalant is asking about the contestation on uh, governance positions and making a point about coalitions and the role of the youth in, in elections. And maybe the, the low voter registration is also an indicator there of uh, perhaps, yeah, the voter apathy amongst, amongst young people in, in Kenya, but I believe they have played a major role in, in these elections. So maybe there's a comment there from our panelists. Um, William Savas is asking, as well as More Ferrer and Lamini, about the you know the, the the four commissioners that that spoke out against the electoral result. What 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 do we make of that? And um, yeah, how how much of a shadow did that cast on 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 the outcome? Um, I think Etienne's question about all elections electronic, um, I think, was answered by by Henry in the chat. Um, Bulalani is asking a question about why is Kenya divided in almost two halves? Why were there not more competitors other than the two uh, that I omitted to mention and that got very, very low, low results? Is there any sort of yeah, political assessment there that our panelists can, can offer? Um, and Tabile is asking, uh, Dr. Bozire, uh, you mentioned that all the elections past 2010 have been petitioned. What do you think this indicates? Could it mean that the system is working in favor of transparency, democracy, constitutionalism, or perhaps increased petitioning is now used to frustrate the uh, electoral process? And it, I think it reminds me of the point I think that, that Conrad made, and I think also Henry alluded to it, that there's a sort of a threshold or a substantive impact criterion that petitions only succeed when there's substantive impact on the result of the election because of course no election can be flawless the, you know the, the 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 exercise is simply too big and too complicated for it to be absolutely flawless but at one at what point does it become an, an irregularity that substantially affects the result and i think this is sort of the the difficult criterion that that always comes in uh, and 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 i think uh, plays a role there um, one sort of element that I wanted to add is I was just reminded of the importance of the combination of technology and, and, and the manual sort of aspect of electoral management. Uh, actually, the more we rely on electronics and the more we rely on technology, the more we also distrust it. Um, so, so maybe it's a case that, that, that the manual aspects will always remain as a, a, a sort of a gold standard in the background. And it reminds me also of the I think it was one election in Zimbabwe where one of the key elements uh, was the um, the posting of of results at each polling station on the door or the the office of the polling station as one of the key mechanisms that that ensured sort of trust in the process that if you cast your vote and it goes through a complicated in technological system to a headquarters actually it, 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 it engenders less trust than when you see an electoral result written out or typed out on a piece of paper and posted on the, on the polling station that same evening or the next day. Sort of the, the dynamic between electronics and, and manual transmission or manual um, uh, uh, recording of, of an, an, and publication of results, I think is, is something that, that plays a key role. Um, let's just read the last few messages uh, of um, Buyiswa. Um, salute both William Ruto and Arala Odinga for respecting the will of the people. I think echoing the points that were made about the impact on constitutionalism. Um, and yeah, another point about coalition, um, the, the nature of coalitions, uh, political party coalitions in um, in, in Kenya. So quite a few questions still on, on the cards. Um, and let me also ask our um, virtual room if there's anyone who wants to briefly take the floor and, and pose a question or uh, make a comment or offer an observation before we hand back to our panelists for 
uh, will probably need to be a one and final input because we have run out of time. But is there anyone who wants to um, take the floor and, and make a comment? Um, if you can do so briefly, then that is very much welcome. Uh, may I, Prof. Uh, Dr. Yes. Yeah, thank yeah, you so uh, thank you so much. It's just to uh, thank the presenter because of the uh, informative input and also the progress of uh, democracy and the constitutionalism in Kenya. And even though the president has made some comment, I think it is his right to to do so as long as the process goes forward. I am much interested, uh, especially that I am leading a student who is interested in, um, in the uh, elect, uh, digitization aspect of it. And I am thankful to Mr. Paul for his answer, but if we can elaborate much more on how the use of uh, uh, the digital technology can advance democracy, and I have also noted uh, the comment you've made, uh, Prof. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, HN. Thanks as much. Appreciate it. Is there anyone else who wants to come in? Um, um, looking at um, Professor Stekler, anything that you want to bring in? I'm also looking at and recognizing a member of the Ugandan judiciary. Um, Justice Douglas Singiza, great to have you in the room. Also a former student at the Institute and alumnus, so wonderful to have you in the room. And if you if you want to offer an observation, please please do so. But uh, let me first hand over to Nico. Yeah, uh, thanks, Yap, and and thank you to to Henry and and Conrad. Um, I really. Yeah, it just shows you we should have had a whole day on it um, and to, to pinpoint because it's in the detail, the devil is in the detail. And I think, uh, Henry, you really pointed out um, where the fine grain is, where animosities come, suspicions uh, hide. And how do you actually manage, you know, with these fine grain issues, a uh, electoral commission that that's deeply divided then. Um, it, it talks about governance, it talks about decision making within the commission, um, and um, how the court must see this holistically and, and it'll be very interesting to find out, Conrad, what were the, the, the reasoning um, for it, because uh, usually, and, and there's two strands, the obvious two strands of, of jurisprudence here, the one was the previous one by the Kenya Supreme Court, we saw um, that the process itself can fault and invalidate a, a election. The other one was in Zimbabwe, where unless you show that there would have been a change in a significant change in the uh, outcome, then, uh, then there's no uh, hope for a petition. So I think much will depend on how the court will build up build on its previous jurisprudence and you know uh, the court has been very strong lately uh, setting aside the the uh, invalidating a, a big uh, constitutional amendment so i think uh, it's really i think as you concluded uh, there's really a lot of strong sentiments coming out that yes kenya is building on the constitutionalism um, both in its practice and and in, in its jurisprudence Thanks, Yao. Thanks, Nico. Uh, I think certainly the Supreme Court Kenya is be fast becoming is already has already established itself as a, a court that is looked upon with great admiration across the continent. In fact, across the world, um, you know, I think for for for, for some time, you know, the, the constitutional court in South Africa sort of. Uh, uh, was 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 playing that role, but certainly the Supreme Court in Kenya is now very much admired um, for the um, the stance that it that it takes and uh, yeah the bulwark that it that it established uh, for constitutionalism in Kenya. So I think that is a yeah is a major development I think for the continent in general uh, and something that uh, yeah that I think we 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 look at with with admiration. Any other? Um, comments from the floor before I hand back to uh, to our panelists. 
Professor Khali Beer. Yes, um, I, I just wanted to follow up on Prof. Nico's comments about the EMB because um, the split in the commissioners was 4-3 but it was a, the, the old guard um, decision that really ruled the roofs. So the Supreme Court upheld uh, Chibukati and the, and the two commissioners um, decision and actions and the four newer appointees um, were given um, a bit of a, a roasting. What does that mean for the IEBC post December, given that Chebukati and the two other commissioners stepped down, their terms of office come to an end? Um, and so you'll have three new commissioners appointed, but you know, there's this dark cloud hanging over the, um, certainly the credibility maybe of the three commissioners, uh, three remaining new, uh, commissioners. Oh, four, four commissioners, rather. So um, maybe just a comment on that um, would be useful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Khalib. Thanks very much. This is probably all we have time for. So let me go back to the panelists. I'm going to start with Conrad and ask him to um, give a short response to any of the questions that he wants to respond to. And then the final word is going to be for our doctor-elect uh, Gichana. So Conrad, over to you. Uh, thanks, Prof. I saw the, uh, Justice Singiza's hand up. We'll hold you in contempt of court. <laughs> I'm so very sorry. Uh, uh, please go go ahead, uh, um, Dr. Singiza. Over to you. No, I don't see him anymore. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, you won't Maybe accuse me of not. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, very interesting uh, discussions and uh, comments on uh, on uh, this. Uh, maybe I can try and answer the, the ones which were directed uh, to me. Uh, from uh, Bulelani, why is Kenya divided into two halves? Uh, maybe uh, we, we didn't have enough time to talk about this, but um, one of the differences between Kenya and South Africa is that uh, I know it's at different levels, but uh, uh, Kenya's politics are heavily ethnicized. Uh, the ethnic identities play a big role at all levels. But when it comes to the presidential election vote, um, the, ethni the ethnic uh, identities play at the big five uh, communities. We have five, the largest five ethnic communities, and uh, out of 43 or 44 uh, ethnic uh, groups. So the five out of the 44, that is in that ethnicized uh, politics environment, uh, presidential election contenders come from those five communities. And none of the communities uh, has an absolute majority when it comes to elections. The largest, the percentages are between 19 and 21 percent. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a country of minorities, basically, but the largest five actually in this ethnic zero-sum game uh, control the presidential election politics. And basically what happens is um, because of the marginal requirement of 50%, which was not there, that is why in 1992, uh, President Moi won with 36% of the vote. But now you have to reach 50%. Basically what this does is that uh, it encourages the building of ethnopolitical coalitions in order to reach the 50%. So what happens? You have the five communities ganging together. So like for instance, uh, the, Moe, the, the, the William Ruto election was is perceived, uh, it might not be entirely true, but it's perceived to be two communities from Rift Valley region and from the central region of Kenya. Those are the two largest uh, and that is where the block of the votes came from. Uh, Raila's uh, election uh, is also perceived, but the, the, there is no clear patterns uh, in this, but it plays within that ethnicized context. So this 50% plus has led to ethnic coalitions and counter coalitions in order to win that election. That is why 
you find us at 50%, 49% among the leading uh, candidates. And, and the two other candidates basically they did not have any threshold. They did not, they had the zero point something of the votes. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the manual and the electronic, uh, we keep going back and forth. Actually, um, in 2017, uh, what led to nullification of that election, a big part of it was that the law required um, electronic transmission of presidential election votes 100%. That for you to validly count an election, uh, one ballot or one vote, it had to go through the results transmission system to the tallying center, not manually. Then during the case, the IBC abandoned and said we actually started counting at the tallying station, the physical forms coming in, the chair announced results uh, before uh, all the, the, the tallies came in. Uh, they, at some point, the lawyers called the, the electronic transmission. Uh, they just called them vote statistics and dismissed. They said they were not important, yet the law provided for that. So uh, even in response to Professor uh, Statler's uh, uh, comment, uh, the, is that if the law provides that you have to transmit votes electronically and you don't transmit a substantive part of it or you don't show the seriousness that the, the law attaches to that electronic process, it's actually one of those process issues that can lead to cancellation of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the the election. And uh, yeah, so the, the IBC, uh, onto the last question, the IBC and the uh, yeah, actually, when the four commissioners uh, uh, decided to, they had, already, they had participated in the in the tallying process until the 11th hour and then decided to go and address the press conference. Um, and the reasons they gave in my assessment were ridiculous. The, 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 they could not convince the court that they had very valid uh, grounds. Of course, one part of the political division clashed on to that and said there is a division, we cannot do this and that. But at the end of the day, they did. In terms of going forward, I, I think I can mention, I think there, there is some gross uh, misconduct and there is the need for an inquiry and see the fitness to hold office. And I can assure you, even if we did that, as a country, after the election, uh, electoral reforms take a backseat. The four, the four commissioners were elected after a three year waiting period and we do things in crisis so i wouldn't be surprised for instance that uh, uh, we let all the pending issues stay until three months the 2027 election but sometimes that is our governance systems uh, work I, I wish we could do it better thank you thanks so much conrad um i saw dr zingiza coming into the room again but he has um been chucked out again. So um, yeah, let's see if we can get him back on. Um, but doesn't look like it. So yeah, let's go over to to Henry for the final input. Over to you, Henry. All right. Oh, thanks, Prof. Um, I'll probably just start by uh, just weighing in on uh, the comment by uh, my senior <laughs> Conrad uh, on uh, the issue of ethnicity and uh, its role in uh, the electoral politics in Kenya. I, I may not be able to share uh, in his take that it's ongoing, uh, or at least on the, at the level at which it's been for the, the last uh, number of elections in Kenya. I share in the view that it's actually declined at the very least in this particular election. It is the first election actually in uh, Kenya's uh, electoral history where we have uh, something other than ethnic mobilization are being utilized as a basis for, for um, trying to get votes. For the first time, we had uh, something that's called the hustler narrative. Hustler in the sense that it was seen as, uh, uh, it's just an economic approach, it's an, an economic model which uh, the president-elect tried to utilize in an attempt to try and appeal across the ethnic lines. And uh, there was a question as to whether the youth actually played a role in uh, his election. I would um, agree in part, although there are no statistics at the moment as to the extent to which it appealed to the youth, but 
practically speaking, that hustle narrative, that economic model where we're saying kazi ni kazi, work is work. And then there were other slogans which were coming in as atupangwingi, which means we will not be spoken for. And up to the point where the National Cohesion and Integration Commission was actually banning the use of atupangwingi in election, in, um, in um, campaigns, because it was sort of creating, there was also talk of dynasties like hustlers against dynasties in the sense that we are trying to restructure the tools for political mobilization in Kenya from ethnicity towards something else. Class, for example, when they talk about dynasties, that we are the lower and middle class, we come from humble beginnings, and therefore we have to bind together to actually put one of us who is not really one of us, but comes from humble beginnings. And then there was the hustler narrative, which is an economic bottoms up economic model, which was also being um, uh, used by the president elect. So the dynasties, and as much as it was um, you know, marginalizing, and then in a sense, and uh, the bottoms up economic model or the hustler narrative, in a sense, introduced a shift in Kenya's politics from wholesomely being on the basis of ethnicity and pushing towards appealing across ethnic divides. And I believe that's a good starting point for few, as to whether it's going to continue in the future is a different conversation, but I think ethnicity in a sense was sort of, it played a significant role as usual, but it was sort of numbed through the introduction of those two. Just to answer the question that was asked about the commissioners again, but uh, um, no, no, the electronic and the digital components. I would prefer we look at Kenya's system as being fully, wholly, or rather significantly manual with a few electronic components, because the only part where an electronic gadget, which is more like a tablet, which is used for identification, for registration of voters, where there are biometrics, the finger, the finger, uh, uh, fingers, fingertips, and eyes and are used for purposes of registration, identification. When you go to a polling station, you put your fingertip, it's it reads the fingertip, uh, your finger details and identifies you. And then for transmission, once the elect elections are completed, a photo of the result form is taken and then transmitted to the public portal to the IBC server. So there are three components where an electronic, um, aspect is utilized, registration, identification on polling day, and transmission of the results. But everything else is actually manual. So that is that is just a clarification on the digital aspect. On the commissioners, there are definitely allegations that uh, um, a lot of what uh, Khalid mentioned that they came in, the, the process of recruitment was a political, there is actually a court case against one of the commissioners that she does not meet the qualifications to continue holding office. Um, but importantly, there is allegations or rather that these commissioners were actually paid uh, prior to that day. There is allegations that there is a money trail that is actually um, traceable back to the commissioners. And uh, um, the chair, Jebukati, has actually mentioned also questions about, I mean, issues that he was promised to be paid uh, if we actually moderated the results in favor of Brian Odinga, and uh, he refused. And some of these uh, um, proposed propositions that we, you're going to be paid, we there is allegations that the commissioners actually went to Jebukati and the recordings, I'm told of this, indicating to him that, look, we have our shares and uh, the easier share that is there if you need it, but we need to moderate these results. So the whole contention really legally was that Chebukati did not involve them in the process of tallying and verification. If you look at my presentation, Article 138.1c of the constitution says the Independent Election Boundaries Commission shall tally and verify the results. And uh, then 138.10 says the chairperson shall declare the results. So they are drawing a conclusion, I mean, a, a distinction between the two, that 138.3c uh, says the commission, and therefore they ought to be involved in the process of tallying and verification. But they say that the chairperson is the only one who took part in the process of tallying and verification. And the basis for the chairperson's conduct was there are regulations which were 
uh, made under the Elections Act. Under those regulations, the general regulations under the Elections Act, when you look at regulations 83, Two and regulations 87.3, um, they give the mandate to the chairperson of the commission to tally and verify the elections and then declare the results. So the chairperson acted on the basis of those regulations, which went through parliament, were approved, and are actually a source of law and direction for purposes of uh, the elections. But they argue and an argument which was also sustained at the court, at the court, at the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court upheld it that those regulations are unconstitutional. But up until the Supreme Court made that decision that they were actually unconstitutional, they were legal. And the chairperson acted legally by actually being in charge of the tallying process and verification process. And he did actually involve the commission as an announcement of the results up to until the last minute when the winner was apparent. And then uh, uh, those issues about non-involvement and the need to break away from uh, uh, the decision of who the winner is came up. Other than that, let me just see if there's any other. The question asked by Bulelani as to whether the unrest which was threatened actually came to pass. I think because for a very long time we've associated uh, outcomes of presidential elections to unrest in Kenya, it's also being used as a bargaining chip. That look, if you don't do this, there's going to be unrest. But up to now, there's not a single um, record of unrest or violence or any sort of casualties, except the question which was raised by uh, Hali on the dangers of um, being part of the commission. There were definitely threats, there was harassment, there was abductions, there was actually one commissioner, uh, a returning officer for um, a constituency in Nairobi who ended up being killed. So that those dangers associated to being part of the commission, there were actually officials from the commission who were arrested and held in communicado and requested for, I mean, forced to provide information about the commission and uh, the electoral process. And all this is detailed in the affidavit of um, Ofula Jebukati, who is the chair of the Independent Election Boundaries Commission. So going forward, again, as uh, um, Halib also pointed out on the question of what happens now once the other commissioners retire and then there are those who remain. As I said, there is already a court case that one of the uh, commissioners called Irene Masit is not um, competent to actually hold the office of the commission of uh, the IABC. It's still in court. Uh, we are here to see what um, is going to become of that. And importantly, as Conrad mentions, there are proposals for constituting a commission of inquiry and uh, the proposals which are being taken very seriously uh, from the information I have, that there's a commission of inquiry that's proposed to be constituted after uh, the swearing in to be able to look into the events of uh, that happened at the National Tiling Center. One other thing which was not mentioned is that before the declaration of the president, there was a bit of fracas at the uh, Bombers of Kenya, even senior officials of um, uh, Azimio, Raila's party, actually tried to manhandle the chairperson to prevent him from actually making the declaration of uh, of um, uh, Ruto as the, as the president. So there are quite a number of events that happened at the National Talent Center, which uh, would require commission of inquiry and a report. And the basis of that report will then determine the future of the IABC. So with that, I will rest and uh, thank Prof and the audience for the chance to be able to weigh in on some of, the, of these issues relating to the election. Thank you very much, Prof. Back to you. Thank you, thank you, Henry, um, and thanks to Conrad, and thanks to the audience for uh, bearing with us and um, and uh, yeah, really participating so um, beautifully in this um, in this wonderful discussion. I think some very very interesting points being made. Clearly, uh, a major step ahead for uh, uh, for Kenya has been made, uh, with lots of room for improvement still, and and and. and Loose ends in you know firming up and um, and uh, the electoral system and the way it impacts on constitutionalism. But I think, yeah, I think a very important development, not just for Kenya but for for the region as a whole. And I think uh, that that's something that we can that we can underscore. Uh, so thanks everyone. Let me not take any more of your time and just thank everyone for being here. This was really a celebration of of uh, of not just the 
constitutionalism in Kenya, but certainly also of the excellence of the two presenters. And we are very proud as the Institute to call them alumni of the Institute. And we very much look forward to seeing um, Dr. Elect Gichana walk across the stage tomorrow, uh, receiving his doctorate. Uh, such a wonderful occasion uh, lies ahead. Um, so thanks everyone for, for attending, for listening, and um, we hope to see you soon. Stay in touch. We will try to circulate the information uh, that was shared at, at, the, at the meeting with the permission of the presenters. Um, and I've got, uh, yeah, no other task to do other than to say thank you and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone, and let's stay in touch.